a very big warm welcome to you in this lovely mild evening. Whether you're joining us by Zoom or by Facebook Live, we're delighted to have you join us and spend this half an hour, 40 minutes with us. Thank you very much. And we're delighted to be here with you. This is the fifth night of our diocesan mission, Be Christ Joy. So, Kaid Mila Falja. As you know, at this stage, this is the evening part of our daily mission schedule. And we are delighted with your positive response to everything on offer to you throughout the day. So keep it up. For tonight, just to remind you of the format, which you're kind of used to at this stage, I would say. There are three parts to the night. Our guest speaker makes their input, and that's followed by a transition piece of music while we gather your questions. So just to remind you, if you have a question, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of your page, you'll see the Q and A icon there at the bottom. So if you have a question at any time while our guest is speaking, you can just type it out and submit it to Frances Rowland. She's gathering the questions behind the scenes and she'll join us after the piece of music. So very, very welcome. On to our special guest. And our special guest tonight is Brother Richard Hendrick. Brother Richard is a priest and a friar. And just to keep you on your toes before we begin and Brother Richard gets you nice and relaxed, I'm just going to give you a little quiz, three clues as to the actual order that he belongs to. I'll start with the most difficult one. He vows his life to the living of the rule of St. Francis. And now, if you were listening to Horizons the Sunday before last, you'd have the answer to this. So just, that's our first clue. The second clue is his order is the same as our great Padre Pio's order is, or Saint Pio, as we now would know him. And the third thing is, there's a cup of coffee named after the order or a person from the order invented this. He can clarify that, Brother Richard, when he joins us in a second. So there are your three clues. And if you're listening to Horizons, you'll know the answer to these. Back to Brother Richard. He has been involved in youth ministry for many, many years. He's worked at second level and at third level as a chaplain carrying out retreats. He's very versatile and he does lots of wonderful things. He has a particular love of Christian mindfulness and meditation. And when we speak with him, when I speak to him, I always get that lovely, relaxed kind of breathing, lovely, lovely manner. So it's his work and it carries into his way of being. And um, he's been involved in several things, including parish work. But what has fascinated me is he's spent the last 10 years blogging. He has his own blog and he has most beautiful poetry on it. Uh, daffodils, snow, nature, breathing, everything. This blog, because you might like to look it up afterwards or visit it on a regular basis, is called Mindful Mystical Musings. He's no stranger to Kerry either, Kerry Diocese, the Diocese of Kerry. He's been down here with young people. He's been down here with priests and on different, at other gatherings and maybe a Lenten talk or two. And everybody who remembers, everybody that I mentioned to remembers, says, oh yeah, that was lovely. So they do remember Brother Richard. So hopefully tonight will also be like that, that we'll take something away from the night. He's based at the moment and he's coming tonight to us from Dublin, the mother house of his order, which is, oh, this is really a fourth clue. It's the day centre for the homeless in Dublin with Brother Kevin. And you might remember Brother Kevin was visited by the Pope when he was here recently. Lots and lots of clues there. Brother Richard's theme is be fully alive so over to you, Brother Richard, and you are very welcome tonight. So good evening, everyone. 
it's it's very good to be with you and uh, thanks to Mary for that that uh, introduction there uh, the order uh, that she mentioned um, which includes the name of the, the cup of coffee is, is of course the capuchins and it was the cappuccino that was uh, named by one of our, our brothers or in honor of one of our brothers. Uh, that's a longer story than I can tell tonight. So maybe you'll, you'll just have to uh, look it up, Google it as, as you go this evening. But I've been invited to, to speak to you on the theme of uh, being fully alive. And at a time when our newspapers and our media is so filled with um, the story of death and suffering and sickness and disease, it's really good that we take some time to look at what it is to be fully alive as Christians, as Catholics, as people who are open to the, the movement of the spirit. And that's what any kind of mission or retreat is. It's an opening of ourselves to the movement of the spirit. It was one of the great early fathers of the church, St. Irenaeus, that said that the glory of God is the human being fully alive. Just let's think about that for a moment, that it is glorious. It is a dwelling in the glory, the light of God to be fully alive. So how do we enter into that life? How can we, we live uh, a fully alive life, even in these straitened circumstances, even in uh, times of, of, um, of difficulty, of pain, of suffering, of stress? Well, the way in which our Christian contemplative tradition uh, invites us to live is to live not just for Christ, not just with Christ, but to live in Christ. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus describes his entire mission uh, as having come that we might have life and have it in all its fullness. Now, the question we have to ask is what kind of life is Jesus talking about? Well, later in that same Gospel, he tells us he is that life. Remember when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is our life. Right at this very moment, we draw not just our, our spiritual life, but even our physical life, our natural life is drawn from God, is drawn from Jesus. In each moment of our existence, God is saying, yes, yes to you, yes to me, yes to me, even in the midst of my brokenness, yes, even in the midst of my sin, yes, even in the midst of the difficult circumstances of my life. And we all have them. We all have that brokenness at our very heart. But beyond our brokenness, Jesus is saying yes. Beyond our brokenness, we have been loved into being by God. We are being held in being by God from moment to moment. And God has only one destiny in mind for us, that we will one day, through his grace, be so converted in our heart that we will participate in the life of God for all eternity. That's, that's what salvation is, to participate in the life of God for all eternity. So this evening then, how can we begin to, to sow seeds of that life? How can we begin to move towards a life that is not just God-centered, not just us attending to God, but us basking in the knowledge of God's attentiveness to us. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. I'm sure you remember that, that wonderful story of, of Moses going out into the desert at a time of tremendous brokenness in his own life. He had lost his identity, lost who he was, didn't really know what his future was to contain and he had just committed murder you can't get much more broken than that off into the desert he goes and he picks up a job as as a shepherd as someone minding sheep and in the middle of a desert day a baking hot day he sees an extraordinary sight a thorn bush that is on fire but that is not being consumed by that fire and curious he goes towards it and you know the story. We all know the story. He hears the cry from the midst of the thorn bush. Moses, you are on holy ground. Take off your shoes. As he encounters the God who speaks to him out of the fire that does not consume, as he encounters the God of his ancestors, gently he is restored to a new way of being. First of all, God reveals himself as the God of his ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is announcing just who Moses is. 
he is part of this great lineage of faith, this great tradition of faith. But God goes further. He doesn't just reveal who Moses is. He reveals who God is. God is the great I am. God is presence made manifest. God is being itself. And so when we know God in this way, when we, we see God as the great I am, the amnes, the being from which all other being proceeds, then we begin to get a glimpse of the life that we are already living. We are living a life of utter dependence on God from moment to moment. God's great amnes speaks in my little I am. But so often my I am, your I am, is a broken I am. We know the difficulties as we try and find our way through life, as we navigate uh, you know, our, our careers, our families, love, all of the experiences of being human, all of the experiences of being up and down, the, the constant roller coaster of our being. But what would happen if we brought that roller coaster to rest with the knowledge that we rest secure in the loving hands of God, that God only intends our good and that God bestows upon us every grace necessary for our salvation. All he asks of us is to cooperate with that grace. And when we fail, as we all do daily, sometimes many times a day, to begin again, to begin again to live the life of grace, to begin again to allow God's glory to shine through us, to be fully alive in God. Now, the ancient saints of the church had a wonderful name for this process. It's a Greek word. It's the word theosis, and it means slowly and gently becoming as alike to God as it is possible for us to become, while still remaining the human beings that we are. God desires this for us. And indeed, uh, the early Franciscan fathers were very, very strong in saying that the entire reason for the incarnation was that God was proving to us just how much he loves us. In his incarnation, in coming into this world as Jesus of Nazareth, he shows that he wants to be with us. Remember, remember that great prophecy of Isaiah that we heard so often in the Advent days, that God would reveal himself as Emmanuel, the God who is with us us. Not with us when, or if, or because, but just simply with us in our being. God wants to share his life with us. So if we want to be fully alive, that's the life that is calling out to us. That's the life that we are, all of us, being invited to enter into, to begin again each day with. So this theosis, this process of becoming as alike to God as it is possible for us to become, how do we live this life? Well, first and foremost, we realize that Jesus is, as we've said, that life. And so we invite Jesus into our hearts. But here is the great extraordinary thing. When we invite him in, we discover that he was there all along. The great Saint Teresa of Avila, one of the, the most extraordinary teachers of contemplation in the life of the church, says that the mistake that is most often made by beginners in meditative contemplative prayer is believing that it is only when they are good enough that God will come and dwell in their hearts. She gives a beautiful image. She says that it's like someone who stands at a window looking out for a friend when the friend is already sitting behind them in the kitchen waiting for them to come and join them at the table. So let's turn around. Let's realize that God already dwells in our hearts. The Christian mystics tell us that there is no human being we will ever meet who is not already a temple of the presence of God simply by the fact that God is holding them in existence. So if we look within and we find the presence of God there, and if we look into the hearts of our brothers and sisters around us and recognize that we will, perhaps sometimes having to look very carefully, but that we will find the presence of God within them, then a great communion of the gaze of love begins, a great contemplative communion of realizing that all of us, brothers and sisters together, are walking forward into the mystery of God's love, are hearing the invitation of God to live that fully alive life. It's also a call for us to recognize that when we dwell in that sacred place at the very heart of our being, 
the cave of the soul, as so many of the saints call it, we will find there the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. But we only find that voice, we only hear that voice when we listen. And listening is very difficult for all of us. We live in a very, very noisy world with all kinds of distractions, all kinds of, of obstacles to our deep listening. And so it's important for us to make space to listen. Now you might say that's very easy for you where you are. I live a very busy life or a very noisy life. My, my family demand my attention all of the time. My, my job demands my attention. All of that is true. All of that is true. But beyond all that, behind all that, there are moments for all of us, driving in the car, sitting in the house, doing the garden, doing the vacuuming, even just being with others of an evening, to take just a moment and to follow the path of our breath to that holy place within us where God dwells and to acknowledge the presence of God, simply, simply. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to say anything even. We just have to be with him. We have the promise of Jesus that the Father is there. Remember when his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew ask him to teach them how to pray. He teaches them by reminding them that all they need to do is to go into that inner room, the room of the heart, to find the Father already there waiting for them, waiting for you, waiting for me. So let's try and resolve to find those silent moments, those silent spaces, because when we do, an extraordinary conversion takes place. We begin to move into a life that is not reactive. It's not bouncing off the walls of whatever stimulus is coming in at any one particular time. Instead, we move to a more reflective way of being, a quieter way of being, a way of being that centers itself on meaning, the essence of our life, rather than just simply activity. Busyness is only worthwhile to us if it is busyness for a reason. Busyness alone is nothing holy by itself. So if you want to live this fully alive life, if you want to center yourself on Christ, who is already centered on you, remember, then occasional moments of stillness, occasional moments of silence, Occasional moments of just dwelling with the Lord in prayer. Not so much the saying of prayers, they're very important too, but making sure that along with the saying of prayers, there is the listening of prayer. The taking into account of that place of glory, that place of God's life within us, where God is, where God is Emmanuel, where God is the amnes of my being, where God is calling me, calling me, calling me each day to become the vision he has for me, because that's what it means to be fully alive, to grow into the vision that God has for you and the vision that God has for me. I may never know what that vision is in this life, but as long as I'm open to it, then I can be sure that the Holy Spirit will do all the rest. A great modern mystic, uh, Thomas Merton, the famous Cistercian monk, on a walk with a very good friend of his who was also mystically inclined and a poet, Robert Lax. On one occasion, Lax asked him, what is it you really want to be? Well, underneath it all, Merton felt what he wanted to say was he wanted to be a good monk and a great writer. I think we can agree he became both of those things. But when he said that to Lax, Lax looked at him and said, no, what you really should have said was that you wanted to be a great saint. And Merton said, well, isn't that a bit prideful? And Lack said, what is it that God wants you to be? And Merton said, I suppose a great saint. Then how dare you, said Lax, how dare you think that if that is what God wants you to be, he is not already giving you every grace necessary to be that. So this evening, let's rejoice despite our brokenness, despite our sinfulness, despite our weariness. And let's rest in the presence of God who calls us to new life in him each day, to begin again each day, 
to open ourselves to the grace of each day. And then we will be fully alive. Then we will be living the life that is already within us in seed form. Then we will be opening ourselves up to the one who is the way, the truth and the life. Mary mentioned that I work with poetry and so I'll bring this part of the presentation to a close with a poem, a little reflection called Morning Grace. If at all possible, do not rush into the day. From the moment you awake, its busyness will want to draw you into its complicated chaos. Instead, pause and then step gently into the grace of morning. Whether you wake alone or with others who need your attention, it is always possible to begin again in gratitude, to begin from the silent sanctuary of your breath, to pray the day into being. Just as the sun rises slowly, so can you. Do what you need to do with awareness, with kindness. Pray, yawn, stretch, wash, dress, eat, drink. But be aware of the praying, yawning, stretching, washing, dressing, eating, drinking. Look at the sky. Notice the weather, not as good or bad, but as simply weather. The sun always shines above the clouds anyway. The kingdom of God is always within anyway. Be present to the kingdom within. Be the presence of the kingdom without. Smile, sing, dance, or don't. The only thing you have to do is breathe, and you are already succeeding at that. Greet your breath as your prayer, and then you will pray always. If yesterday is present in your mind, notice. Ask what it wants to teach you, and return to your breath. If tomorrow pulls you onwards, notice, tell it you will need it when it arrives, and then return to your breath. Today is the place you stand, and the only place it is truly possible to be anyway. So be here now, choosing to be here now. Touch the earth with joy, look at every being with love, smell the coffee, smell the roses, smell the sweat of work, all of it will remind you that you are alive. You are here for another day. So if at all possible, do not rush into the day. Instead, let the grace of the morning in. Thank you for listening this evening. Brother Richard, thank you so much. That is beautiful. You've almost silenced me, but not, not quite yet. We have a piece of music that you've chosen. You've chosen a piece from Brother John Michael Talbot, uh, I Am the Bread of Life. Now, we didn't. Brother John isn't singing it himself. We went local, very local. So Jer might play that for us now while Francis is gathering questions and she'll join us after this piece of music. Thank you. The bread of life All who eat this bread Will never die I am God's love revealed I am broken That you might be healed. All who eat of this heavenly bread, all who drink this cup of the covenant, 
you will live forever for I will raise you up I am the bread of life all who eat this bread will never die I am God's love revealed I am broken that you might be healed no one who comes to me shall ever hunger again no one who believes shall ever thirst all that the father draws shall come me and I will give them rest I am the bread of life all who eat this bread will never die I am God's love revealed I am broken that you might be healed Welcome back and um uh, Welcome to Francis Rowland, who's going to uh, gather a question or two for our brother Richard. So Francis, thank you. Off you go. Thank you very much. Richard, inundated here with questions and really very, very strong questions. Uh, the first is, I suppose, you've spoken about basking in the knowledge of God's attentiveness and God's love. We don't always feel worthy of that. Where do we start? Well, we're not worthy of it, but it comes anyway. It's grace. <laughs> it's gift. That, that's, that, that's what it means. None of us will ever be worthy of it. And no matter what we do, we will never be worthy of it. And God says, that's okay. You know, um, there, there's a difference, I suppose, between the of, of sin when we find ourselves in those, in, in those, those situations. But then there's repentance and conversion. And God is constantly calling us back inviting us to begin again. St. Francis put it beautifully. He said, referring to his earlier life, I have been all things unholy. If God can work through me, he can work through anyone. So we rejoice. That's very encouraging. Thank you. That's very helpful. The other sorts of questions that are coming in, if I can group them together, I suppose, is summed up in the question of, should we have, or how do we develop a contemplative practice uh, so that we notice God as God draws God's attention, our attention to God during the day. So, and how might we start that? Sometimes it's very hard to still the mind, to still the spirit, to still all that's going on around us. Sure. Sure. Sometimes we can get very caught up in technique, you know, yeah. um, and it's very, very simple, really. Um, my, my, the, I always say that the first teacher of contemplative prayer I ever had was my grandmother. Um, and it was simply the fact that that she she prayed the way so many people in Ireland prayed, which was that as she went about her day to day work underneath, under the breath, constantly, there was just simply sacred heart of Jesus. I place all my trust in you or, or Mary conceived without sin. Pray for us to recourse to the, all of the old aspirational prayers. And that word is important. Aspiration means to aspirate, to, to breathe towards. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing in, in those moments is simply connecting with God. It's it's like the little child who's walking along with, with their parents. They want to be independent, but every now and then they run back and they just touch. They just touch, just as a way of, of reconnecting, of making sure mum or dad or gran or granddad or whoever is still there, you know, uh, as they become braver to go kind of fur further away. So I think rather than getting up, getting caught up in, in, um, in techniques, 
what's important is intention more than anything else. If it is your intention to be present to God, then you are present in that moment. Simply ask. Uh, we want very complicated things. We want great revelations and extraordinary teachings. All of that is there in our tradition. But as we begin, as we begin, we begin simply as, as the Holy Family of, of Nazareth lived, that simple day-to-day -day life of working, of being present to one another, but recognizing that underneath it is the current, the current of God. Um, the, the, the old uh, way of, of teaching this was to, to view it as what we call the sacrament of the present moment. You know, the sacrament of the present moment. And that meant a tuning into the present moment as a place of encounter with God. Um, we often find ourselves thrown into the past with worry and anxiety or thrown into the future with worry and anxiety, particularly in, in, in these days. And remember, the media want us to be anxious because then we seek them out for more information. Now, absolutely attend to the news of the day and be present to the world. We're, we're, we're called to that. But we're also called to recognize that there is a truth beyond all of that, and that truth is the presence of God's love. So I think um, for us to simply practice each day, uh, as I said in, in, in the little poem, not just eating and drinking and walking and working, but tuning in, really asking yourself, how am I present to this in this moment? Um, and then recognizing that behind all that is, is, is the love of God and touching in with that love through those little aspirations throughout the day. If we're finding silence very difficult, well then allow your silence to be threaded through the name of Jesus, through the repetition of the rosary, through those little prayers. Uh, and that's a way of connecting and, and holding contact with God. Very powerful, thank you. Another grouping of questions that have come in have, have been around, I suppose, that the God you're talking about in some sense isn't always the God that we've met in our experience of life, maybe in our formation, uh, maybe the way we're brought up and a feeling that many people have walked away from God, but it's not the real God that they've walked away from. And perhaps for many of our young people, they haven't heard or haven't, the, the real God has not been um, presented to them. Any suggestions of how we might do this more as, as individuals, as family members, as communities? The, the, the simplest thing is start with your own relationship with God and allow that glory, that light, that presence to shine from you. I think too often we immediately go to programs and preaching and teaching and all of those things. And really what's, what's really being asked of us is an interior conversion. Um, look at the way Jesus did it. You know, that's, that's the great example. Um, he, he taught by his very presence. Uh, that was the primary way of teaching so that others would say, where do you live? And he could say, come and see. Uh, and that's that's what we're asking for. Now, of course, he taught as well, but that, that teaching came from, uh, I suppose, along the, the process, along the way. Mm -hmm. So it, it's important for us to have encounter with God first. I, I taught in schools for many, many years. And again and again, you would have the conversation with parents who were very worried about the way in which maybe young people had abandoned the, the, the practice, of what they saw as the practice of the faith. You know, I, I think while it's very important to teach and to call back and to show our beauty and our truth, uh, today's the feast of Thomas Aquinas, the great apostle of truth, you know, to, to really uh, show the truth that we have. But we have to speak the truth in love. And so I would always say to, to those, those parents, you know, um, as they were panicking about their child who said, I don't believe in God. The first question is, well, do you believe in love? And if you believe in love, then you believe in God, because our faith teaches that God is love. So if we start from that beginning and, uh, you know, that, that someone is trying to live a loving life. Now, we may be living a loving life, um, you know, in, in, uh, in a way that perhaps needs to be more attuned to the word of God, more attuned to, to, to our way of faith. But we start with the good. If we honor the good and start with those seeds of goodness, then as, as, as I mentioned, God is already providing the grace for us to become what we are, what we are meant to become. So I think my, my first um, teaching for myself primarily is in every encounter, is somebody meeting the kind of God that I want to meet? Because if they're not, then I need to go and work on my practice first. That's a brilliant answer. Uh, just a last question, Mary, if you'll allow it. They had you pegged very quickly, uh, Brother Richard. They knew you were a Capuchin and they knew all about Cappuccinos. 
Um, but people are asking, okay, they, they've loved the poem that you uh, recited there this evening. Any other poems that we can access and can we access them through your own blog? You, you, you'll find um, most of the writing is, is, on, is on the blog. I'm also on Instagram and on Facebook. Brilliant, brilliant, because people would really uh, like to... Just so they look up Brother Richard, they'll find it. And those daily posts go up, they're open to the public. Come, right. come along and, and, and be part of that. Um, uh, so I, I generally, I, I post two or three times during the week. So you should, you should be able to come across them there. Thank you. I mean, and we are conscious that, yes, we must develop our own practices, but it's sometimes nice to have something that reminds us and draws us back and calls us back. So thank you very much. The, the, the questions were, were, were well re received. Thank you. And thank you, Francis. Sure. And thank you, everybody who has given us a question there, because you see how wonderful it is to have the questions to respond to. Brother Richard, just if you had a sentence or two just to wrap up, to leave us thinking before I wrap up the night fully, just what would you like to leave us with? I think St. Francis put it beautifully to the brothers every day, every day, he would say, let us begin again, for up until now we have done nothing at all. So to see each morning as a new beginning, to, to recognize that the only thing we can take from the past is wisdom. And the only thing that awaits us in the future is another opportunity to experience God's love. After that, we just have the now. And in the now, our God is Emmanuel, the one who is with us. Brother Richard Hendrick, so that everybody knows your name and they can Google it and they can look at your wonderful blog with the gorgeous poetry, absolutely lovely, inspiring poetry. Thank you very much for joining us tonight from Dublin. And we could hear the sounds of Dublin occasionally there in the background. So thank you very much. We <laughs> appreciate it. We really do. Um, just to say to everybody, thank you for joining us tonight on our mission. Uh, as I say already, as I said already, it's part of our full schedule. We have reflections in the morning, we have reflections in the evening, we've pray and play, and we have mass every day as well. 